They met all their deadlines. They produced a plan. Again, extremely competent technically. Pretty good uh, from the standpoint of using information from uh, other sources. And it's, on, it's online. It was just published in uh, December, the end of December of this year. The public participation process, again, was extensive. Even though they had a short period of time, they had 18 listening sessions, which are basically public hearings. They had an advisory committee for citizens that served as a conduit of information from people who couldn't participate in the public planning process. These were eminent citizens of Massachusetts that sat on this committee and, again, sort of screened information for the planning process. They had a science advisory commission that looked at the science content of the plan, met four times during the course of the plan and provided information at various points in that plan. And perhaps most importantly, they, they went out of their way to meet with private interests that had a, had a stake in the outcome of the plan, but more importantly, were able to provide information to the planning process. So it was a case where public participation was used not only to inform people, but also to gather information. Pretty, pretty unusual case. This is Norway and a plan for the Barents Sea. Barents Sea is the northernmost sea of, uh, of Norway. They divided their EEZ into three pieces. The activities that take place in this area are very important to the Norwegian economy. They include oil and gas. Oil and gas is critical to Norway. It's the richest nation in the world and is fueled largely by oil and gas revenues. Not so many up here in this part of the world, although exploration is beginning to take place. Fishing is a big activity and marine transportation is very important here. <clears throat> but in addition, Norwegians are very environmentally conscious and concerned. And so one of the first things they did was identify these biologically and ecologically important areas. And they restricted activities that took place in those. Those are mostly the near shore areas. They're things like the polar front, which is variable in the year to year, but they say wherever that polar front is, you're not gonna conduct any activities, particularly oil and gas activities at certain times of the year, etc. So it's a good example of including all major sectors, especially oil and gas and fish, and tr marine transportation to a lesser extent, and nature conservation. I said planning should be future oriented. This is the Netherlands. Uh, difficult to see, but uh, these are basically existing uses of space in the Netherlands. I just want you to note the change here, if you can see it. That orange area is a very interesting area. Netherlands is a very low-lying area. They're faced with climate change and sea level rise in particular. They had three scenarios that they had of different heights of climate change. The Dutch have a lot of good coastal engineers that could calculate exactly how much sand they needed to replenish their shoreline to deal with climate change of various, or of sea level rise at various levels. And they actually allocated that orange space as a priority area for sand extraction to deal with beach replenishment over the next 50 years. That is an area that will not be used for any use other than sand extraction. It's a large area of their, uh, of their EEZ. Another kind of integration is what do you do across boundaries? And Germany is an interesting place. Many of the examples I was talking about, the national government has jurisdiction right up to the high water or low water mark, depending on what the country. But in the case of Germany, they have a jurisdiction of the state, the, the lander in Germany, the provinces, that extends out to 12 miles, and they have responsibility for planning in that area. And the federal government goes from 12 miles out to 200 miles. So there's, there's a question of coordination between what the lander are doing and what the federal government is doing, very similar to what the United States is facing. But they also had a problem with, with adjacent countries because they border Belgium and the, and the, and the Netherlands. Actually, the Netherlands and Germany, not, not Belgium. But uh, these three countries all had spatial plans that were developed quite independently of each other. They didn't coordinate. And the result was at the edges of their, their maps, the uses were not compatible in some cases, not all cases, but some cases. Protected area on one side, sand and gravel extraction on the other side. So again, just points out the issue of trying to coordinate across boundaries as part of the early part of the planning process, not the end. They now have to go back and redo their plans to get rid of these inconsistencies. A quick mention of what's happening in the United States. 
I like to talk about the United States as a developing country when it comes to uh, marine spatial planning. We're adverse to most kinds of planning in the United States and we hate zoning. So uh, it's difficult to, uh, to get anything uh, going in this area. But we had a change of administrations, which goes to show you what importance you can put on leadership, political will. Uh, back in this, this past summer, the president, actually the president of the United States, Barack Obama, signed a memorandum instructing all of his departments to come up with an ocean policy, number one. We've had two big studies, but nothing ever much happened to our, on our ocean policy. He wanted an ocean policy that he could sign off on in 180 days. And he wanted a spatial framework, an interim framework for effective coastal and marine spatial planning in 90 days. And that deadline again was uh, met in the end of, uh, or the beginning of last month. And the United States suddenly has discovered marine spatial planning and uh, is going to do something. Something will happen. Okay, to sum up, quickly 12 lessons learned from spatial planning. Again, authority is absolutely critical. Financing, something we planners and administrators don't think about very often. We're often given mandates to do something without any money to get it done. But financing is critical, and if you don't have the resources in your allocated budget at any level of government, you've got to go out and find some resources to make this all happen. Effective stakeholder participation is absolutely critical, or you won't sustain these efforts over time. Information is a critical part of spatial planning as well. You want to have a sound basis for making, uh, doing analyses and finally making decisions. Deadlines are critical. Again, think of the Massachusetts idea. Uh, again, apologies to people who heard some of this yesterday, but when you're faced with execution in 24 hours, it sort of focuses your mind on what you're going to do in those next 24 hours. And marine spatial planning, if you have to produce a plan in one year, sort of focuses your efforts pretty quickly rather than having an unlimited amount of time to produce a plan. I use two examples. Massachusetts is one of a good, I think a good outcome of a short deadline. And one that is not such a hot outcome of a long or no deadline is the ESIM process on the east coast of Canada, which started a planning process one year after the Ocean Act was passed. I think it was 97 or 98. And 2007 produced a strategic plan, which is a short document, doesn't say a whole lot, doesn't have a lot of real action in it. But it took 10 years to produce that document. And because, again, there was nothing to focus the final output of the plan, plan itself, in the, in the form of a deadline. No deadlines in the Ocean Act. Needs to focus on the future. Again, I've talked, I think, enough about that. The planning is future-oriented. It needs clear goals and, more importantly, measurable objectives. Okay? You need measurable objectives because if you put yourself out into the future some way and look back and you have nothing to gauge your, your progress, you're not going to be able to learn how to do this in a better way. I know, I ran the National Coastal Management Program in the United States for a while. I had to go testify before Congress and somebody said, and what have you gotten out of this program for a $2 billion investment in coastal management in the United States? I couldn't answer that question very well. So we quickly pulled together some stuff, but it was the problem of not having good measurable objectives in plans that we could actually evaluate and say this is what we achieved. Monitoring and evaluation, again, we can't adapt plans without monitoring and evaluation programs. These are usually afterthoughts. They're a critical, integral part of the planning process. Learn by doing. We often are much too cerebral about planning. We hate to sort of get down to sort of making decisions, so we don't really learn by doing. We sort of try to get the perfect plan together, which doesn't happen. Spatial planning can deliver certainty and streamline permitting, which is what the private sector really is interested in. It can find appropriate space for nature, which is what the environmental community is primarily focused on. And if all these happen, 